Hello, and welcome to the Kaidan Kai, where we read a story about the supernatural every week. I'm your host, Linda Gould, and I'm so happy to present today's story, The Burning Police Car, by Anne Hansel. A samurai places a curse on his enemy. Whoever hurts his family will be maimed or die a horrible death. A curse on one family is a blessing spell to the other family. But are curses effective against people who don't believe in them? Anne Hansel has been deaf since birth. She's a third-generation Japanese-American and a distant relative to one of Japan's most famous historical families. You can see her full bio in the episode description. Before I read Hansel's story, though, I want to take a moment to mention the passing of Stephen Lester Carr. Some of the Kaidan Kai listeners and contributors will know Carr because many have been published in one of his Sweetie Cat Press anthologies. I didn't know Carr personally, but I did email with him a lot, and I know from our email conversations that one of his priorities was to help up-and-coming authors. Tim Law recently outlined on his podcast how Carr encouraged him to write when Law had lost confidence. And I think Carr was instrumental in helping the original 100 Stories in 100 Days Kaidan Kai take off. He contributed two stories, which I'll link to in the episode description, but he also posted it on his Facebook page, and that's how other contributors heard about the opportunity, many of them who have contributed multiple stories. So I'd like to dedicate today's podcast to Stephen Lester Carr. May he be inspired wherever his soul rests and may he find a way to share his stories with us. Here is The Burning Police Car by Anne Hansel. Enjoy. Every day, police stop motorists and explain their infraction before writing out a ticket. Sound familiar? Yeah. But in my case, it didn't happen that way. You see, I'm deaf and I have problems communicating with certain police officers who stopped me. One day, I drove up a ramp, and I glanced at the traffic light. It was off, so I went through it without stopping. A police car caught up with me and flashed its sirens, so I pulled over at the nearest shoulder. A woman officer got out of the car, then came up to my driver's window. She looked young, probably in her late 20s. She had a lean, athletic body and long, blonde hair that peeked out from under her helmet. She wore dark glasses and spoke to me, but her lips moved too fast for me to lip-read. I pointed my fingers at my ears and shook my head. She understood. I gestured to her, I gotta get my purse. She nodded. I fished out my license, car registration, and insurance. She examined them and issued me a ticket without saying a word. I raised my hand. She waited again. I got my smartphone out and typed, What have I done to get this ticket? She replied, You ran through the ramp light. I protested, typing, But the light wasn't on. It wasn't working. Reading my reply, the officer's face looked hard, unmoved, cold. She typed back, Well, you have to go to traffic school for this. I could see her mouth moving. She seemed to be snorting as if she wasn't impressed with me. Now I understood. I've met some hearing people who dislike me due to my deafness, but I put them out of my mind and got on with my everyday life. She got in her car and drove away. This time I was furious, shocked at her lack of sensitivity. Too bad I didn't get to tell her about my family curse. You see, I'm a third-generation Japanese-American, and my mother's family comes from a long line of samurais. Back in Japan, my uncle told me about a certain ancestor who had worked as a samurai during the shogun days. He wasn't happy with all the blood and violence, so instead he studied the black arts. One night, an enemy clan invaded his family castle and slayed his brother, sister-in-law, and their children. His loyal servants managed to smuggle his former wife and children out of the place, and that was how our branch of the clan survived. My uncle cast a spell upon his enemy. He warned, 
If anyone dares to hurt or insult my family, this enchantment shall kill or injure him or her. But if anyone saves or blesses those of my flesh and blood, he or she shall receive generous blessings. The curse worked. Since that time, anyone who hurt or insulted my relatives ended up badly injured or dead, and those who helped or treated us well often received great fortunes or long lives. This ancient spell followed me now. During my teen years, a certain girl bullied me terribly. But shortly after that, she became paralyzed from her waist down in a terrible car accident. Her parents took her out of my school for good. Years later, I was a university undergraduate majoring in history. I saw a young girl I knew from biology class at a nightclub. She came from a super wealthy family, and she always looked down at me for my middle-class upbringing, calling me a low-class loser. She even did it there at the club. But that night, I saw her leave with a young man who gave me the willies. The next day, the police found her dead, raped and stabbed to death with a hunting knife. I guess a side effect of the spell was that it brought guilty people to justice. The people arrested the creep in no time at all, thanks to several witnesses at the nightclub. My best childhood friend, on the other hand, found out about my ancient family spell when she gave me a gold brooch. The next day, her parents won several million dollars in the lottery. Some of my close friends treated me to lunch or dinner whenever they needed good luck with their university finals. So although I was angry about having to go to traffic school, I also had concerns about the lady officer who had given me the ticket for no good reason. I knew my old family curse would harm her very badly sooner or later. But I had a brother-in-law named Simon he was a homicide inspector at a local police station. We met at my sister's wedding and got along so well, he learned American Sign Language. One day, he invited me and my boyfriend, Carrie, to a big party at the station. I was a paraeducator, living paycheck to paycheck, and had a side job baking desserts for parties. So Simon asked me to bring in a large chocolate bundt cake with vanilla frosting and a couple dozen frosted sugar cookies. He helped us carry the cake container and two large boxes of cookies into the party. Plenty of people, in uniforms and evening clothes, milled about, chatting and drinking. Carrie had excellent lip reading and speaking skills, so he went along with Simon to converse with others, while I went to help prepare meals and desserts in the snack room. All went fine, until I went into the party carrying a tray of handmade submarine sandwiches to the buffet table. That's when I spotted the blonde officer who had given me the ticket. After I left the buffet table, I went straight to Simon and explained what had happened with that officer. He raised his eyebrows in concern. He had seen weird things due to our ancestral spell. He said, Phew, looks like Officer Katie's going to be in big trouble sooner or later. I better go warn her. I watched him, but she laughed and looked over at me with disdain. She muttered something to him, then went to chat with others. Apparently, she still didn't take me seriously. But I was still anxious about her safety, so I went toward her. <laughs> she noticed me and walked away to talk with some tall officer. I tried again. She walked away again. Well, finally, I cornered Officer Katie, and I typed, I'm concerned for your safety. All I need is your apology for your rudeness, and then you'll be able to live. She read my message, coughed several times, then dropped my phone to the ground. Her smirk showed me she had done it on purpose. I kneeled to pick it up. It was cracked. I looked up at her. She looked pleased. I sighed and went back to Simon. He shook his head. That wasn't nice of her, he said. But don't worry. She'll get what she deserves sooner or later. We both tried our best to warn her, but she didn't believe us, even called us a couple of weirdos. It's her choice, so we best let her go. I remembered feeling so frustrated and helpless that evening. And sure enough, two weeks later, I picked up my newspaper and saw a big headline. Police officer dies in burning police car. 
a blonde female police officer was patrolling a neighborhood about two miles from where I live. She stopped a gray sedan for a traffic violation. The car pulled over, a man got out, and faced the officer. It was 15 minutes past midnight. The street was empty except for parked cars, a few bright street lights, and dark houses. Officer Katie was going to cite the guy for something and write a ticket, but she didn't know that the creep was a serial killer preying on women, and he had a particular taste for blondes. I turned on the television for the morning news, which had gained access to a house security camera. Over breakfast, I watched the killer grab the officer's wrists. She had tried some self-defense tactics, but the killer had a third-degree black belt in karate, so he easily knocked her unconscious. He dragged her to his car, out of sight of the camera. This made my stomach lurch. I almost vomited my breakfast back on my plate. I believe Officer Katie had just become the latest victim of my ancient family spell. The camera showed the killer taking the body to her police cruiser and putting her inside before driving it away. According to the news, the killer had driven for an hour and stopped at a 24-hour gas station where he purchased a gasoline container from a cashier before taking the police cruiser to a nearby park. There, he pulled the body outside put her on the ground near the cruiser. He poured the gasoline all over the car and the dead officer before using his lighter to set them afire. But the park was surrounded by three apartment buildings. I believe our family spell blinded him from seeing them. The bright flame attracted plenty of attention and people ran out of the apartment buildings to the burning cruiser. The killer? He tried to run away, then tripped over the exposed roots of a huge tree, breaking his arm. Adding to his bad luck, several men walking home from a party a few blocks away pounced on him and pinned him to the ground. The murderer was finished, I thought. I felt bad for the dead officer and her family. I texted Simon and he typed back, Yeah, they already informed me last night. We filed several charges against this creep already, including first-degree murder. He's going to have a trial, and he'll look at either a life sentence without parole or the death penalty. I felt so bad for Officer and her family that I sent a large wreath of white carnations to her memorial service. If only she had apologized to me, none of this would have happened. Although the late police officer was unpleasant to me, she didn't deserve to die in such a horrible, painful way. I believe we should treat each other with respect, even those with unique characteristics. It's the right thing to do, the right way to behave. But even if you disagree, who knows about somebody's family background? There may be one or two curses somewhere. We don't get many stories about curses on the Kaidankai, and I like this one because it wasn't really an evil curse. It was more a vendetta curse, right? And as the character said, no one deserves to die a horrible death just for being a rude person or throwing their weight around. But that's the great thing about fiction. You can have things happen. You can get your revenge on people who do things in real life through your fictional characters. It feels so good. Has anyone else done that? I have. I based a character in one of my stories on a horrible man who I once worked with. I ended up leaving that job that I just loved, specifically because of that man. And he eventually ended up getting fired in real life. But in my story, let's just say, my character got fired too. But not from his job. (laughs) Plus, in this story, a couple of serial killers got caught. Everything worked out great. Except for poor little Katie. Thank you for listening today. Next week's story is also set in Japan, but it's Thanksgiving week, so it's all about eating. And it's short, so you can listen between your main meal and your next Thanksgiving snack. As always, please review the podcast, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and now YouTube. All the information is in the podcast and episode descriptions. Thank you for listening today, and I'll see you next week.